Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Wildwood. Glad you're all here. And uh, we especially welcome visitors, those of you who are new here, who are not regular church attenders, because we're eager to tell you about the joy we have in knowing Jesus and coming together as a group, as a body of Christ, uh, to worship him together. And I'm sorry to tell you that Wildwood is a church full of imperfect people. Such, we're such losers. But, you know, we're winners because we worship a perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's why we gather today. And uh, if you want to know more about Wildwood, uh, I'd encourage you to check at the Connection Hub, the lobby uh, afterwards, or grab me or even really anybody. Uh, we can get you the information uh, that you need to know about uh, what it's like to be here. I'd invite you to stand as we begin our worship service with prayer. Dear Father, we come to worship you today, and we come to sing, pray, and to listen, and we know you always hear us, but Lord, this morning, help us to hear you as we worship. It's in your holy name we pray, amen. Here we go. I love to tell the story of unseen things of
For Jesus does save, and some of you didn't know me when I was a younger person. But if Jesus uh, can save me, he can save anybody. And you know what? He does. And it's available to anybody. This uh, verse from Hebrews, I think, is important. Let's read it together. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus saves. or two at our prayer time, week or two ago at our prayer time. Uh, you know, we do from time to time I have you all say names, uh, you know, of people that you know need prayer. And it's always such a moving thing for me to hear all the names. And then I wonder how they're doing. You know, I wonder about progress and uh, if they have felt God's touch that day. Uh, we're not going to do that today. Uh, we're going to pray for you. Uh, and I want you to pray for yourself. And I guess a couple of things. Uh, one is, where are you in your walk with Christ? You know, for me, I became a Christian, I was 20, probably 21. 
I'm a little older than that now. A lot, of, a lot of miles under the bridge. A lot of ebbs and flows in my faith. Uh, I've never doubted since then, but I know that during the course of my life, sometimes I've stepped a little further away. And then God keeps calling me back. And maybe you've had a similar experience. Maybe you don't know what faith is like in Jesus. What is it like to really give your life to Jesus to say that you are the Lord of my life, to be baptized, buried in death, and raised to walk in newness of life. Maybe you haven't done that yet. And maybe God keeps bugging you about it, and you say, I'm not doing that. So uh, I guess this morning, I, I would like you to take a look deep in your heart. And if you feel like you're a little further away from the Lord than you have been, maybe just take a minute and say, hey, you know, I, I, need, I need you. I need your touch. Uh, and there's no shame. There, there is shame, okay, when things in our life kind of overwhelm us and we feel shame and we feel far away from God. And, and you don't feel like you ought to go back because you're not worth it. <laughs> you are. He died for you. I mean, how much more could he love you? And all he wants is a relationship with us. He doesn't want you to be perfect because I already told you, you're all, you're not perfect. No, I'm not either. None of us are. But, we, but Jesus is, and he keeps calling us back. He's paid the price. We're perfected through him. So don't stay away. If it's been a while, step up, say hi. And it's okay to pray for other people too, but this is uh, however, you want, however you feel led to pray, and I'll join you in just a minute. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you are good and your love endures forever. And through what Jesus did, our chains are gone. We've been set free. And yet sometimes we find ourselves living in that same place of being bound, of being uh, from you. And it's, it's our own doing. Uh, maybe we've let the evil one get a stronghold in our life. Maybe we've failed in times and uh, we sin. And, uh, you know, uh, we all do. And in spite of all of that, we don't have to make ourselves holy before we approach you again. We approach you, and you make us holy through what you've done for us and through your love for us. So, Lord, help us to break down those strongholds, the shame that keeps us away, just the feeling uh, unworthy because we are, all of us are unworthy of what you've done. And that's the amazing grace that we just sang about. I pray for those who are here this morning who haven't given their life to Jesus, but maybe you're kind of wondering, uh, what's that like, and why should I? Lord, I just pray that you'd reach them today in, in some way and remind them that uh, all have fallen short of the glory of God, but all have been called. So, Lord, we want to receive uh, your salvation. We want to be reminded of the amazing thing that it is, this grace that has set us free. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Thank you. Thou hast 
familiar with the Lord's Prayer. It's found both in Matthew and, and Luke. And this week I was kind of thinking about one, one verse. It says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive. Forgive can be kind of a hard thing to do. Sometimes the hardest thing for a person to do is to forgive themselves. When we seem to be growing in our faith, the old images, sinful things begin to play in our minds. This can lead to guilt, remembering some failures. Is forgiveness for others, but, but not for ourselves? The enemy loves to remind us of the mistakes we've made because guilt keeps us kind of frozen in time, keeps us in bondage, unable to move forward. The Bible says that when we ask Jesus into our hearts, we're a new person. Looking at 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. God is at work with every detail of your life, and that includes our mistakes. God takes even our errors and works it out for good. The cross clearly demonstrates this. God took the very worst event in history and turned it into the very best. If he can do that, he can take the worst things in your life and turn them into good. If God gave his only son for you, is he likely to withhold anything else? This morning as you take the bread and the juice, communion is a reminder of Jesus' sacrifice for our sin, a gift, a gift of his love, and his desire to live in you. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful and blessed for your amazing love. Thank you that in all things, you are working for the good in each of our lives, and absolutely nothing can separate us from your love. In Jesus' precious name.
Halloween person. I'd much rather say praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Ever since I was a small child, I have been very privileged to just be aware of God's presence with me. Sometimes I followed him closer than others. Sometimes I listened a little bit more intently than other times. But I don't know what my life would be like without knowing that the Spirit is constantly surrounding me and leading me. Is that your experience as well? That's why on days like this, I'm always excited because I know that time and again, God has given me a message to share with you, but not today. A couple of weeks ago, one of the members here came to me and said, when you get to chapter 15, I got a sermon that God gave me that I want to preach. Well, now he's done some preaching in the past, done lots of ministry for the kingdom. Most recently, though, he and his wife Joanna own Grayley's Ice Cream downtown, Grayley's Creamery. Yeah. Well, I don't, I, I, as much as I love ice cream, I care more about the Word of God. Would you welcome Brian Compton to the stage? Good morning. Wow, you guys are alive at 8 o'clock. From what I hear, there's no 8 o'clock service, but you guys have, are a lively bunch, and to hear you guys uh, sing today was just phenomenal. Um, I know that God really enjoyed hearing you. So, um, I want to thank Pastor Ron for the opportunity to share with you this morning. Uh, it's been a few years since I've gotten to stand here, uh, not here specifically, of course, but, but um, stand in a pulpit and just share... So, thank you so much. And today I'm really honored just to share with you from God's Word. And um, as, as Pastor Ron said, my name is Brian Compton. And uh, you may not know me. You may not know me by that may, name. You may know me by other names. Um, Dingo Dan, for instance, if, if you were at VBS. Um, some people call me Mr. Grayley. Some people call me, hey, Mr. Ice Cream Man. Um, Mr. C, brother husband, and of course my favorite of all, daddy, which I don't have anybody here today um, calling me daddy, I hope, but um, when, when uh, that would mean my kids are back from college and it would be a little scary because I wouldn't know they were coming, so, but um, when scripture gives us a name, uh, it, it gives us a name for God, it says something about who the Lord is. And um, something that he wants you to know about him. Now, names in today's day and age don't mean a whole lot, right? Uh, I, people get named all sorts of things. Moonbeam, right? Uh, Brian, uh, I'm sure you've heard of some very strange names in the past. But when the word of God, when God says, this is my name, it's something he wants you to know about him. And can I tell you this? He wants you, or he wants to know you more than you want to know him. Everything we know about God from his word, everything that the spirit that teaches us, tells us, is a gift. It's by revelation and revelation alone. And one of the ways he wants you to know him is through his name. That's why God gives us so many names. And, and you would think one would be enough. I am, right? God, that would be enough. And yet, he gives us so many names. Well, what's in a name? Can I just tell you, everything is in a name. Not in our culture, as I said, but, but I can tell you this. If my mom ever said my middle name, I knew I was in trouble. Brian Allen? Boy, if she ever got into throwing in all of my siblings' names, I don't know if this happened in your family, but Lynn, David, John, Brian, Allen, Compton, boy, I was in deep weeds. And forget it if she threw the dog's names in there as well. So, there, but, but uh, in the culture in which God spoke to man, in which the scriptures were written, in every name that he gave us, there's something going on. Number one, it was always at a point of crisis. If you ever study the names of God, and I encourage you to do that if you've never done that before, um, you'll be amazed that at every point of need in life, 
of his people, God reveals a name. So it's like saying that it's as if he has a name for every crisis in your life. And, and what does that mean? It means that he gave us, uh, that, that he has grace for every crisis. He has the solution. He is the answer for every crisis in your life. And that's why he gave us names at points of need and crisis. The other thing is, he revealed his name because it's exactly what you needed. Why is he called El Shaddai? It's because we need a God who is almighty. Why is he called Adonai? Well, because we need a God who is owner of everything, who is Lord of all. Why is he called Elohim? Because he is the God of majesty who can create a new in your life, just like he did in the beginning. So what's in a name? Everything. You know, a burglar broke into a house, and uh, the, the couple, there was an older couple that was there, and, and they, they startled him, and uh, the burglar looked up and said, I'm so sorry, but you've seen my face. I'm going to have to kill you now. But before I do, I want to know your name. And the couple, terrified as they could be, looked up at and he looked at the woman and said, what is your name? And she goes, my name's Elizabeth. And she goes, oh my goodness, I, I can't kill you. That was my mother's name. So then he looks over at the man and he says, well, what's your name? And, and, and the man said, well, my name's Frank, but my friends call me Elizabeth. <laughs> I hope you understand that there is a whole lot in a name. And God reveals himself and wants us to discover who he is. The name that we're going to be speaking about today is probably one that all of you have heard, but may not fully understand. The name is, um, well, let me set it up this way. As Pastor Ron has been taking us through the book of Exodus, and possibly like a TV show previously on Exodus, um, Moses, born, told to be killed, put in basket, raised by Pharaoh's daughter, kills, a, kills an Egyptian, runs away. So far with me? I mean, that's kind of the pictures you get in TV shows, right? Goes away for 40 years, comes back. Well, before he comes back, God says, a burning, has a burning bush and says, save my people. And Moses says, uh-uh. And he says, yes, go. So Moses goes back. And then there are the plagues. And then after the plagues, then Pharaoh finally lets the people go. And uh, they go and they get to the Red Sea and they cross the Red Sea. And uh, it's, it is one of the most amazing miracles that has ever happened. And, and they cross the Red Sea and now they're on a journey to the Promised Land. And, and, they've, and they've just witnessed the most incredible in terms of redemption. And that's actually the word that's used in Exodus. It means to buy back, to set free. So they've been set free. And in just a few days, um, they, they, uh, they get to the Red Sea and they cross on dry land. It's amazing. And afterwards, they go for three days. They go out and, and, and they're thirsty. There's no water. And so what do they do? They begin to complain to Moses. Where's the water? We're going to die. We're thirsty. And it's at this point that we're going to pick up the story in Exodus chapter 15. So if you have a Bible or in your app or on your phone, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 15. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 22. It's amazing that this follows an incredible song by Moses that we talked about last week. A song where they sang to the Lord, the people and Moses, a song of praise. And isn't it amazing how quickly we can go from praising God to complaining to God? It gets there in just a heartbeat. And you'll see in this verse that they've changed their song into one of grumbling and complaining. Now watch this. Then Moses made out, made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days into the wilderness and found no water. And they came to Marah. And they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter, and therefore it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, 
And he threw it in the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and will do what is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptian. And here it comes. For I am the Lord, your healer. Jehovah Rapha is his name. And then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and there they encamped by the water. My prayer for you would be that you would spend more time at Elam than at Mara. But I can predict for you today that sooner or later, everyone will come to Mara. What does the name Rapha mean? It, it, it means a God who heals. It means Yahweh heals. It's used over 60 times in Scripture. This is the very first place it occurs. This is where God himself reveals himself as a, as a healing God. And I want you to understand that even though we're going to find ourselves in that oasis of Elam, those times where we find those moments of refreshing, where, where we'll enjoy the 70 palm trees and the 12 springs of water, there will be days in our life where we will be at Mara, the bitter water. Sooner or later, everyone's going to be at Mara. Can I remind you that Moses led them to Mara? That, that God engineered it and brought them to this place of bitterness. And when, when you come to Mara and you have to drink from that well of bitterness, you know the first thing we normally do is get mad at God. We get bitter at God. And, 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 and when you come to Mara and you have to drink... Um, well, I think most bitterness in Christians today can be traced back to, to a disappointment with God. We grow angry in our circumstances and we get bitter with God because of what we're having to go through. read a study this week about research in church and what some of the biggest problems in church are. And um, do you know what the number one issue is in church members today? Something we don't like to talk about, but it's bitterness. And, and, and we don't like to say we're angry with God. We don't like to say we're bitter because we have to be pretty on the outside when we come to church, right? We have to smile. We have to look like everything is perfect. And, and it's funny that Robin said earlier today, nobody here is perfect. We are very spiritual people, aren't we? And we're godly people, but deep down we've taken this bitterness and we've stuffed it in and we've shoved it down and it's deep inside of us and we're angry with God because he didn't do what we asked him to do and because we had to drink bitter water. Sooner or later, everybody's going to be there. And so it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And what do we do with that bitterness? Well, sometimes we take it and we turn it on each other and we're very hurtful. Have you ever heard the saying, hurting people hurt people? And you know those people in church, not, not anyone here of course, but you, you know those people in church that, um, that, that, that uh, are so difficult? I call them extra grace required people. Um, if you look behind them, look and they may still be drinking from that bitter water of Mara. You know, the stuff in your life that takes joy away. When you stop and you quit singing and you don't want to worship, probably behind that is a bitterness towards God. And that's why we must praise Him. Not because life is good, but because God is good. And when you have to drink the bitter water, you need to say, as Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And you must guard your heart against bitterness. The, spirit, the, the scripture says that bitterness begins as a root. And it grows and it poisons all of you. And not only poisons you, but then it starts to come out on all the people around you. And sometimes that's why people have trouble loving others. Because they're angry inside. It may be an unforgiving spirit. Maybe someone has hurt you and you don't want to forgive them. 
You had to drink the bitter water of a brother or sister in Christ who offended you, who wounded you. Um, it could have been even a church leader here at our church or, or some other church. And, and you know, we have this twisted way of dealing with forgiveness, don't we? We say, we're going to withhold forgiveness, and that's going to hurt them. That's going to punish them. Well, guys, that's kind of like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You're kind of like the little boy who um, got in trouble and, and his mother put him in time out in the closet. And he just he was angry and he's spitting all over everything, just spitting everywhere, pss, 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 spitting everywhere. And, and um, suddenly he, it gets all quiet and his mother sneaks over to the closet and, and says, what are you doing? The little boy says, I'm waiting on more spit. You know, there's little intervals in life where we wait on more spit, but the rest of the time that bitterness might just be spewing out of us. It touches everybody. And, and can I tell you, sometimes the thing that makes us bitter is that we get tired. We get weary. Maybe like Elijah in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19, we go and we fight the battle on Mount Carmel, and we see this incredible miracle of God, and then we stand for boldness when nobody else is, and we stand for God, and then suddenly we get tired, and we want to crawl up under a juniper tree and die. If we don't deal with that correctly, that frustration and that weariness begins to create bitterness in us, and the anger uh, in us, and it just touches everyone around us. Now, I, I don't know what you know or think about depression and discouragement, but can I tell you this? Being discouraged is not a sin. It's not. But staying there is. Because we have a God whose name is Jehovah Rapha. And it's given to us in the context of bitterness. That is, that's where he steps in no matter how godly you are, no matter how decent you are, and how closely you walk with God. There are going to be times where you're at a place called Mara. And can I tell you this too? Getting busier doesn't make it better. Cranking up speed is not going to help your bitterness. That's what, I, that's what created the problem. I'm convinced in many of our churches today that the problem exists because we are too busy. And we don't slow down and drink in from the deep well of God's love and be still and know that he is God. We equate busyness with spirituality. Have you ever seen this before? We need to have more programs. We have to have more plans. We need to do more things at church and more meetings. And the more and more we do things, we think we're going to be closer to God. All the time that we're having all these meetings, we're taking mommy and daddy away from families. And we're, we're destroying families as we go. My grandma said something once that has stuck with me. And if you take notes, this may be the wisest thing I say all morning. So write this down. The most active chicken in the yard is the one who just lost his head. Does that communicate? Do you understand? That's what I grew up with. So don't tell me that activity is spirituality. It creates sometimes a disappointment and a bitterness that creates weariness and frustration. Sooner or later, everyone is going to be there. Second thing I want you to hear this morning is this. You need to learn to build your faith on his character, not on his miracles. Learn to build your faith on his character and who he is, not on his miracles. How could they, three days after they see this most amazing miracle, where walls of water come up and there is dry land in a path that million can come through, how is it that three days later they could be saying to God, Oh God, you've forgotten us! And how could they go to Moses and then complain? We're just dying here, God. What's God going to do? And they've just seen this, this, this amazing miracle, and the, but suddenly they have this attitude like, what have you done for me lately, God? You know, you know why? Because we all tend to do that, don't we, sometimes? We, 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 bend our, we build our faith on his miracles and on the blessings than we do on the character of God. So when we see a blessing... 
which, yay, let's praise God. And when we don't, we get angry. There's going to be seasons in your life where you see the obvious hand of God. In fact, there's going to be times, though, where you walk through the valleys of the shadow of death. But here's the thing. Christ didn't come, away, come to do away with suffering. I know that's popular in churches today. But Christ didn't come to do away with suffering. He didn't come to explain it away. He came to fill it with his presence. Because there are things that you will learn about God in a storm that you won't learn anywhere else. You know, when the disciples, when they were caught in the storm, and they stood, and Jesus was asleep, and then Jesus stood on the boat, and he said, be still. And the waves stopped, and the wind stopped, and the disciples, they knew him, right? They knew Jesus, and yet what did they say? Who is he that the winds and the waves would, stop, would obey him? I mean, okay, no, I think they may have known a little bit about him, but there are things that you don't know about God until you walk through a storm or until you walk through fire. And the beauty of this moment in your life, if you're going through that, is that when God leads you to Mara, He is revealing a di dimension of His love that you have never seen. When you walk away from Mara, you're going to walk away with a better understanding of that God is far deeper and greater than you had ever imagined. I like to say it this way. You never know what you'll need. You'll never know he's all you need until he's all you've got. And that's why you end up at Mara, to drink the bitter water. So trust in his character, trust in his name, not his miracles. And, and for every Mara, the third thing I want you to hear and understand is that for every Mara in your life, there is a Jehovah Rapha. There is the Jehovah Rapha. For every Mara, you know, there's, there's a lot of different types of brokenness, aren't there? A lot of different types of healings. But I, I think the scripture makes it clear if you track the word of Rapha throughout scripture that it means some different things. I mean, sorry, the word Rapha, yeah. Um, one of those things is physical healing. If we look at Psalm 103, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all its benefits who forgives all your iniquities, and what? Heals all of your diseases. So don't tell me that God is not interested in healing. I'll tell you this, whether it was surgery, whether it was chemotherapy, whether it was medicine, whether it was a treatment, it was Jehovah Rapha, and Jehovah Rapha alone that heals your body. He uses it all as tools. So if you walk into Mara, and that bitter water you're drinking is a physical one, you cry out to him. His name is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. You know, sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes it's a broken heart. Sometimes it's a spirit that's just broken. And isn't it a wonderful promise in Psalm 147.3 that he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds? You know what a broken heart is like, right? It's when your kids walk away from the faith that you poured your whole life in. And your heart breaks. It's when the husband comes home and says, Oh, I found another woman. And your life falls apart on the living room floor. It's when you lose your job. It's when the report comes back and, well, it's not very good. It's when you get the call in the middle of the night and you, you've lost a son or daughter or grandson. You know, there's so many things. It's when you've been hurt and wounded and your spirit is wounded and your heart is broken. His name is Jehovah Rapha. And he heals the brokenhearted. He binds it up. Do you guys remember the movie Forrest Gump? Long time ago, I know many people may not have seen it, it's an old movie with uh, Tom Hanks, but there's some things I like, some things I really don't like in that movie. But in the movie, Forrest has this lifelong friendship with a young girl named Jenny. And in one scene, they're both grown up, and, and Jenny is just beginning to get out of the bad life she was in, and, 
and they're walking down a dirt road, and, and, and there's this moment where Jenny is standing back looking at an old farmhouse, and it's the house where she was abused by her father, and um, there's all these rocks around. You remember this scene? And she's just standing there, and now Forrest is there with her, and she's just looking at that house, and, and no one lives there anymore, and it's run down, but all those memories and that bitterness comes flooding back, and Jenny picks up rocks, and she starts throwing them at the house, and, and it peels off the paint, and she throws another one, and it breaks the window, and then she goes both arms and just flailing, throwing rocks, and then she falls as tired and collapses there, and Forrest says, Jenny, sometimes there's just not enough rocks. You know exactly like what that's like because you've carried that wound with you for so long. And you need to understand that no matter what the wound or how it got there, his name is Jehovah Rapha. He heals the brokenhearted. And you need to know this. He heals us from the greatest disease of all, which is sin. Can I take you to Isaiah for just a moment? Isaiah has this wonderful verse in chapter 53, verse 5. It says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. You see, the greatest healing you're ever going to receive is from sin and the brokenness that it brings. His name is Jehovah Rapha. So this last thing I want to tell you. If you go back to Exodus 15 and look, how is it that the water became sweet? How is it that, that, that what did God tell Moses to do? He said, you see the tree, pick it up and throw it in the water. You know what's something interesting about that word tree? In the Septuagint, which is the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it, that, the word tree is the same word that's used for cross in 1 Peter. So if you think about it, it, there might be some kind of picture here that the only way bitter water becomes sweet is through the cross. In other words, the healing comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And in other words, bitterness can become sweet. You know, the Lord, our, our Lord prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that that cup that he prayed was one of bitterness. And our Lord drank it into himself and all the bitterness of our lives. Do you remember in another garden, the Garden of Eden? God's plan wasn't one of bitterness. God had it all worked out. He had it absolutely perfect. And all we had to do was enjoy him forever. But because of sin, bitterness entered in. So everything gets messed up. And on Calvary, God reversed the curse. And so the only way that bitterness can become sweet, and the only way for you and I to deal with that bitterness, is to find ourselves at the foot of the cross. Because that is where bitterness becomes sweet. The Lord says in Exodus, he said, if you will obey and you will diligently seek me, if you will diligently follow after me, I will keep all the diseases that I gave to the Egyptians from you, because my name is Jehovah Rapha. And so many people want to dwell on the, 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 the plagues there. But what he's saying is it's a promise that he gives you. If you will obey and diligently seek me, I will heal you. If you notice how many times God talks about healing in Scripture, He also talks right then about repentance and confession. In James chapter 5, where it talks about healing and, and the prayer of the faith and the anointing of oil, have you ever noticed the verse that follows that? It says, if you have sins, confess them one to another. You see, the greatest thing to do to find healing is to find confession in the cro to the cross. Can can I show you a picture of what that's like? Jehovah Rapha is there for every Mara in your life. And he said that if you will simply confess, if you'll simply come and openly cry out to him, he will hear you and he will turn your bitter sweet. There's a hand motion. I, I, I'm a children's pastor at heart. Um, 
I use hand motions and songs and things. And, and, and when my kids were little, there was a hand motion that I used with them. And um, since COVID happened, it, it's taken on a whole different meaning. But can I just show you, and maybe you want to do this with me. You take your thumb and put it in the center of your hand. And then wrap your fingers around it. To me, what I would tell my children is this is me in the center of God's will. This is me in the center of God's heart. Recently, in domestic abuse cases, this is mean, means a sign to say, um, help, I'm in trouble. It's so that you can do it on Zoom meetings, and you can, if somebody comes up to your door and you're having trouble, you can do this sign, and, and, and people know that you're being hurt. But when my kids were little, and they were scared of the dark, I would have them as they're going to sleep go, here, God's got you. He's holding you. And I think in domestic cases, and I don't want to make light of them at all because domestic abuse is serious. It's horrible. But this sign, while it's letting others know you might be in trouble, is also a reminder that God is still in control. The safest place you can ever be is in the center of God's will. I wish I could say, I, I, I could take credit for this. I, when I was in, um, a, a young pastor getting started, um, we had a young intern that worked with our youth. And um, our pastor one Sunday preached about this. And the young intern, about a week later, found out he had cancer. 20 years old. And... Um, rapidly progressing cancer. And he was in the hospital, and, and we were there, and we were trying to minister to him, and, you know, trying to say all the right words. You know, there's not ever always the right words to say when somebody's in that. And, and, the, and this young man, he couldn't speak. He couldn't talk. Um, and, and people were crying around him. And I remember him raising up his hand. funny when an intern, when a kid can preach to you, right? Jehovah Rapha is his name. And sometimes that healing is not one where you get to jump up from the illness and, and, and take your bed and walk. Sometimes the ultimate healing is spending time with God in heaven and going to see him. And that's what that young man was reminding us. Can, can I make three practical suggestions? I know I've talked a lot about Scripture, but I always like to, to tell my kids, to here, let's take some three practical suggestions. If you're looking at, and you're filled with bitterness, number one, learn to listen to God's voice. I mean, what is God saying to you right now in the middle of your trials? I don't know all of you. I know some of you. I know there's trials, and every single one of us is going through them. And, and, and sometimes it's real easy to hear from God when we're on the mountaintops. But when we're in the valleys where our, our cell phone reception isn't so great, it's hard to hear from Him. So ask yourself, what is God trying to tell me right now? To show me about Himself. What does God want to do in your life right now at this minute? Number two, mind your attitude. I know it says... Do what's right, but, but I started thinking last night, and I changed my notes, and sorry to the pastors. Uh, but mind your attitude. Behave righteously. When we start to drink from Mara, when you start to have that bitterness in life, stop grumbling, complaining, but do what's right. Realize that God is not out there to get you. He wants the best for you, even if it doesn't make sense right now. And rely on the character and the nature of God. You know, God doesn't ever change. And he is trustworthy, and he is living, and he wants to meet all of your needs. And thirdly, obey his commands. When you find yourself at the bitter waters, look to see if there's any disobedience in your life, and make it right. If God tells you to do something, do it immediately. Right? Delayed obedience is disobedience. That's a whole other sermon. So what's the bitterness in your life this morning? What is it that God wants to say to you? 
What is it that He wants to meet with you right here in this chair, in this seat, in this room? He says, you've got something in your life. You're bitter. Let me heal you. I believe God will break through whatever bitterness there is. So I'm going to invite you just to to close your eyes, to sit there for a moment, to commune with God. His name is Jehovah Rapha. I don't believe that you need to come to one of the staff, to me, to tell us what the bitterness is, what the disappointment is. It, it doesn't matter. If it's physical or emotional or it's spiritual, God is the one who is there. What matters is that you come to Jehovah Rapha and let Him bring you healing. And the musicians are going to come in a minute. Or now. All you need to do is cry out for Him. And cry for Jehovah Rapha. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God of so many names, thank You for giving us this one. That You are a God who heals. That You see us at the innermost core of who we are. And You love us in spite of us. In spite of all the things that we've done wrong to You. God, thank you that you love us so much and you want to heal us and bring us closer to you. We are in awe of your character. And God, it's because of that that we want to praise you and thank you. God, if there is someone here that needs your heart, that needs your healing today, I pray that you would blow over them like a fresh wind of the Spirit. And let them know that you are alive and real. God, I love you so much. In your most holy and precious name. Amen. I invite you to stand and make this our response to God. He makes all things beautiful in his time. In his time. In his time. Just in case anybody's asking, my name is Elizabeth. <laughs> Praise God for that sermon, huh? Yeah, you know, it's pretty big. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, it's kind of amazing how many people think that when you are walking with God, Elam is the only place you go, the place that has the water and the palm trees and the rest. But, it will, but we have the faith to also say that sometimes we have to go to Mara. Right? The things are tough sometimes. But here's what happens. When you build your faith in God, then all of a sudden you aren't saving things up for the just-in-case times. You trust God in the good times, and you trust God in the bad times. Amen? And so when it comes to our offering time, which we're going to pray for in just a moment, that is really a sign of our faith and our worship of God, of saying, God, you have blessed us with so much that we will give it away. Because we will trust that even in the bad times, you'll give us enough. In the good times, you give us enough to share. Amen? So I'd just like to pray for our offering today that you'll drop in the box on the way out. Use the app on your phone. 
or send a check in or whatever you do. Let's just pray for that first. Father God, I just feel a need today to just recognize that you have blessed us in so many, many ways. Not just money, and not just when the Dow Jones average is good as opposed to, to bad, but every moment of every day you give us another heartbeat, another breath, another relationship, another church service, another song to sing, another touch from your Holy Spirit, another word to, sh to speak, to share, to learn, to know. So, Father, I just thank you for this church, for the faith that she exhibits, and the trust that she has in you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we go today, I also want to mention that today is the day before Halloween, which is significant only because this is when we're doing our trunk or treat. As we talked about last week, why do we do this every year? We do it so that we can invite the community onto our campus and bribe them with candy and ask them to come back for, for, for worship. It's a pretty good trade-off, I think. If you want the sweet life with Jesus, here's a candy bar. Right? So you can still help out with that today. You can pray for it. You can attend. You can bring neighbors and friends. Or you can talk to Christy today. and She'll be glad to, to plug you in uh, for our trunk or treat this afternoon from 3 to 5. Me, personally, I'm going to be handing out hot dogs. Less healthy than candy. Right? Make sure that, that, that you got the connection this morning, the bulletin, and can see the other things that are coming up. Just turn to somebody near to you and just say, thank you for being here today. Now, before you go, look at an empty chair near you and just imagine who you're going to invite to sit in that seat next week. Got that name? Father God, send us from this place with your love, with your blessing, but most of all, your spirit. Let us walk in boldness and confidence, and let us be humble before you, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you guys.